Well, as you know, since the Lisbon Treaty entered into force, it should be the exclusive competency for foreign direct, um, the exclusive competency of the EU level to deal with foreign direct investment. So it shifted from the national level to the European level. And that's why we thought, given that new situation, a seminar on that topic would be very useful to have. You are here in a very large room, because this is the room of the Liberal group, and it's a very large group. <laughs> um, I heard comments from some panelists that um, Liberals tend to have um, two opinions per person. That's why we need a bigger room, but <laughs> um, that's beside the point. We are uh, we're happy to welcome you here. Um, in that new situation after the Lisbon Treaty, the European Parliament has a much more involved role in dealing with all the trade issues, and we have um, discussions about investment protection policy, and that I believe is also very important that it's in this House which works in an open and transparent manner that these discussions take place and where the public stakeholders can also have a say in that. And that's why I'm very happy to welcome a lot of stakeholders uh, here as well in that, in that seminar. Last year in April, we, we in the Parliament passed a resolution on the future of European international investment policy. And it was quite a general text. And um, we were looking at the policies, different aspects for, from investor protection to protecting the right to regulate, inclusion of sustainability criteria, dispute settlement, and many other items. And today, it's time to look at the more detailed questions, more technical questions, because we're one and a half years um, since April last year. We have been dealing with the, um, we are dealing with bilateral investment agreements, BITS, and we have found a compromise after quite lengthy negotiations with the Council, moderated by the Commission. And um, we have as the next dossier in, in Parliament, in the Trade Committee, um, the um, financial responsibility between member states and the EU, basically, basically the question who pays if a foreign investor finds their investments being endangered by EU or member state regulation. So another quite potentially controversial dossier. And we will also always look at the investment chapters of all the free trade agreements that are negotiated, which is quite a large number, which is on the table right now. And only last week, you all heard about that uh, in the light of the potential start of negotiations on an EU and China investment agreement. We also had a hearing of the committee of the Trade Committee in this House about that, uh, about the EU's investment policy with China. So I think it's a good time to have that seminar here on foreign direct investment and how we want to protect European investment abroad. And um, um, so we will deal with hopefully several different questions. And um, some of them could be if the Commission, and this will, Frank, will be Frank Hofmeister's rule to, to uh, answer on that, I guess. Um, has, the, has the Commission been so far successful in its new role um, in creating EU investment protection policies? It was quite difficult. How will the Commission go ahead with um, the other dossiers? And does the Commission have a clearer view on the policy area now when it comes to the various sensitivities in member states and, on the other hand, the European Parliament, which defends the European competency in this way. Also, and this would be, um, I guess, a question to, to Dr. Henkel, how do member states see the new role of the Commission? Are you happy about having signed the Lisbon Treaty? Sometimes in the European Parliament, on different, many different dossiers, we have the feeling that the signature was done without being 100% clear of what member states signed up to. And also, where do third countries, investors, EU businesses see advantages, and hopefully not too many, but also see disadvantages of the EU's new role? And um, what role will state dispute settlement, in investor to state dispute settlement mechanisms play in the future? Do we need them? How do we need them? Um, do we need them at all with 
developed countries, questions that might be answered. And also, how do you feel about uh, sustainability criteria in investment protection uh, agreements? Do you think they're useful or would you prefer to deal with those issues outside this kind of agreements? So these are some of the questions I hope will be addressed today. And for this, I'm very excited that we have really excellent speakers. And we have two panels. So the first panel is already here. The second panel, when we do a, a quick changeover after the first panel finished discussing. And on the first panel, I'm happy to welcome Frank Hofmeister, who is very well known in these, um, on these premises. He's the deputy head of cabinet of Commissioner Karel de Gucht. And whenever it gets difficult, it's Frank who solves it. So I'm very happy that you're here. Uh, and then we have Dr. Hans-Joachim, well, we have well, Mr. Hans-Joachim Henkel, who is the director for foreign trade and investment promotion in the German Ministry for Economics and Technology. And I'm very happy to have you here, not only because you're a compatriot, but also because obviously for Germany, the issue of investment, of um, um, investments abroad as an exporting nation is quite a big issue. And um, we have uh, Mr. Zahn here, who is the Director of Investment and Enterprise Division of UNCTAD, the United Nations Conference on Trade on Development. And the second panel uh, I will just briefly mention, but will it be introduced, I'm sure, also later. We've got Pascal Kerneis, who is the Managing Director of the European Services Forum and very passionate about trade issues. I, I heard you speak several times on these things, so I look very much forward to hearing you. Mr. Gonzalo Aspiri, who is, from, um, who is the Corporate Director for Institutional Relations from Repsol, a company which made quite some headlines last year and still ongoing with having exactly the type of difficulties that we would not like to see European companies have abroad. And um, Christoph Benedict, who is the General Counsel of Alstom, a French company but General Counsel in Germany. So. Uh, also, very, very interested to hear your, uh, hear your points of view. And last but not least, we have an excellent moderator, I, I believe, Karen Coleman. She is from Ireland, award-winning journalist and broadcaster. If you would be Irish or if you've been to Ireland, she is a uh, what do you, household name. Huh? That's <laughs> what everybody knows somebody else, isn't it? Um, uh, so not only there, but on very, very controversial list. And you wouldn't guess when you see her, but she's been also reporting for a lot of war zones. So uh, I hope the seminar will not qualify as such a zone, but more <laughs> of an intellectual debate. So thank you very much, and please have the floor. Thank you very much, Silvana, and it's indeed my great pleasure to be uh, your moderator for today's event. As Silvana said, we're going to break the discussion up into two panels. Uh, the first is going to address the topic of a shift in competence with what implications for policy making and the protection of European investments abroad. Each one of our panelists is going to speak for roughly 10 minutes and then we're going to throw it open to the floor. And, uh, I'd like to remind you as well, we have a nice cocktail reception after the whole event, so if you can stay for that. So first up is Professor Frank Hofmeister, whom Silvana has already introduced, but he is the Deputy Head in the Cabinet of the Trade Commissioner de Gucht. He's been there since 2010, and his field of work in this position is the WTO and Dispute Settlement, G20, Trade and Environment, Agriculture and Geographic indications, trade defence, instruments, OECD and public procurement. And prior to that position, he worked as a European Commission official at DG Enlargement and at the Legal Service. Frank. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Honourable Member of Parliament, uh, distinguished audience. Uh, I was asked to give a short overview about the shift of competence and what does it mean for our practical policy. Uh, and I would like to do that in three steps. Uh, first, let us briefly recall the reasons for this transfer of competence. Uh, second, uh, we should have a look at the member states' bilateral investment treaties. What is the um, current state of affairs after Lisbon on those? And then most prominently in the third step, I will run you through to the European investment 
action. So what have we done in the last two years to exercise this new competence? So on the first point, why did the treaty makers in Lisbon decide to shift the competence? If you look at the travaux preparatoire, uh, you won't find much, basically. It came in the Convention on the Future of Europe. Uh, there was no big discussion about it, uh, and therefore one has to reconstruct a little bit. And uh, I would submit uh, probably there were three main reasons. Uh, first, uh, already before Lisbon, there were clear links between trade and investment issues. Uh, for the specialists of you, there is the services agreement in the WTO, the GATS, which has a mode three, which in European language we would say the right to establishment. And that, of course, addresses issues of investment. If you have the right to establish, that is a precondition that you can exercise your investment properly. So there were links, but they were incomplete. And, of course, European Commission negotiators knew that on the one hand they can discuss about services, including modes three, but they cannot discuss properly what happens after. So there was a certain need to go beyond that border which was set by, by the previous situation. Second, um, I believe uh, there was a feeling in the convention at large we should strengthen the EU power in the world. And that also means uh, that we should unite forces because if we punch together, we achieve more. That was a general theme in the convention, and that was certainly also translated in a few more competence for European Union, and uh, foreign direct investment is a case in point. So the idea is probably if the European Union negotiates with a big other state, such as China, the results might be more promising than when individual member states do it on their own. And the third point, probably was uh, the current situation is a little bit dissatisfactory uh, for European companies who would, not, who would not currently be protected by their national policy. So if you have smaller member states who did not negotiate a BIT with a certain country, those companies are left in the dark. So to, this leads to discrimination when you discriminate uh, inside the EU, you will have, of course, the EU rule who, who will help you. But if you are discriminated abroad because your own government didn't negotiate a BIT, uh, the only solution is to have a European approach. So in this kind of uh, respect, uh, I would think there was uh, very powerful drivers uh, to bring the European Union level involved in this kind of idea to better protect European investors abroad. This brings me to my second point. Very briefly, what did that mean to the bilateral member state investment agreements that already exist? Would they be jeopardized or even become somewhat superfluous? Clear answer is no. Under international law, there is continuity. The Treaty of Lisbon will not have a direct effect on a third stage which has never signed it. So those treaties remain in force. And uh, the only question uh, we had to resolve is, of course, um, is there under European Union a possibility to continue operation in these uh, treaties? Could member state amend a treaty if necessary? Could it exercise its rights under those treaties if at European level the competence has shifted? These questions could have probably led to legal uncertainty. And in order to overcome this, the uh, Commission had proposed this grandfathering regulation uh, at the very beginning of our mandate, and I'm very happy to say that after some discussions between both the Parliament <coughs> and the Council, a uh, political compromise has been found this summer, uh, and uh, the uh, regulation will most likely enter into force very soon, so that we provide legal certainty for our companies that those BITs continue both under international and European law as before, with one proviso, of course. Once the European Union comes in and negotiates, concludes its own investment agreement with the very same third country, then the European Union agreement should, of course, prevail and uh, substitute those BITs from individual member states, and then we have some procedural rules for this. So this is very important, and it will help 
in, for example, the case Repsol mentioned, because the Spanish Argentinian BIT is in force, can be used, and the European Commission can actually help if need be and if requested. Ladies and gentlemen, my third point, how have we now exercised our competence uh, um, in the last two years? A lot has been done. I really have to say this. We are currently negotiating investment chapters in three FDAs, Canada, quite difficult, Singapore, also not easy, and India. And on all these matters, uh, important questions of policy making come up. Our general line is we want to achieve so-called gold standards, meaning what member states have done previously with this very same third country should be our yardstick, that the European Union should come up with the best solution offered to an individual member state. It's clear that the European Parliament will have to consent at the end, and that may also uh, put questions to us whether one should not add some additional new provisions, such as sustainable development. That will be discussed, and I guess we will have questions and different ideas from the panel here, and I'm ready to address this in a discussion. Further on, we have uh, standalone uh, initiatives. So with China, we wish to open negotiations on an investment-only agreement, so not a broader FTA, simply on investment, but from a European perspective, this should cover both market access and protection issues. That is our big uh, goal. And currently with the Chinese government, there are exploratory talks on how to get there. And uh, um, last but not least, I can tell you from our practice, we get more and more requests from individual companies that we should help them if they have investment problems abroad. No? So through demarches, through letters, through other signs from our delegations, it is clear that uh, companies nowadays tend to believe, yes, my national government can help, but probably the European Commission's help could also be seized. No? So this is a, a new development, uh, and I think it, uh, we live up to those expectations. Ladies and gentlemen, I have 10 minutes, therefore I will uh, try to sum up uh, uh, with the following. Uh, from the Commission perspective, we believe the European Union as a whole has been rather active on the file. On the legislative point, together with the Parliament and the Council, we have done, uh, I think, our, our homework on the BITs. We will have the next one on the uh, financial responsibilities. And we hope also to exercise on the European level with important partners EU-wide investment protection chapters, but uh, there are, are ongoing negotiations on which I cannot be too precise in detail and ask for your understanding. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. And his work as an international lawyer for a large German engineering company um, and a period of research in Brazil. He joined the German Economics Ministry in 1989 and he has held various posts in the Ministry's Directorate General for External Economic Policy, including as chairperson to the Interministerial Committee for Export Credit Guarantees. Dr. Henkel. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Ms. koch -Marin, for the invitation to join this audience. And um, uh, I think you found an extremely good time to bring us together um, to discuss where we are and where we go for. If you will allow me, I would like to go one step back um, and um, recall the core problem of an investor in abroad, which leaves us to discuss about investment protection. That is um, that there is a dramatic change of uh, leverage once the investment has been realized. Before the in investment is made, the recipient country, the environment where he, the investor is investing, are eager to get him, and he has the choice to do the investment or not to do it. 
after the investment has been made, this changes dramatically in the majority of cases. And too often then, we have seen in the past that the investor can become an easy prey um, for exposed to arbitrary or unfair treatment. And it is precisely the investment protection treaties that try to remedy that, to give some support to the in, in, uh, investor which is getting into such a vulnerable situation. Frank Hofmeister has already very well explained why we decided to move the competence for investment protection um, to the uh, European Union um, in 2009. I just would like to recall some of the topics which um, are making us um, uh, seeing a big interest in this. Uh, the EU has an enormous interest in this issue and an enormous leverage um, in doing the right things. Uh, the European Union is the biggest exporter of foreign direct investments worldwide. It has the largest experience. Frank Hofmeister already has recalled we have 1,300 investment protection treaties in the European Union which had been uh, negotiated and concluded in the past where we can rely, rely on. And the European Union, as he explained already, is a much more powerful partner for any negotiations, representing 500 million people and a gross national product of 13 trillion euros. No member state can have the same power of negotiation the European Union can mobilize. Um, what he already stressed very well is, uh, and what I only can, can confirm is that, is that we have a common aim, and this aim is strong protection for investors and investments. Um, if I may cite from a recent statement between the European Union, Union and the United States, governments should provide the highest possible level of legal certainty and protection against discriminatory, arbitrary, or otherwise unfair treatment. And it continues, this includes the right to prompt, adequate, and effective compensation in the event of direct or indirect expropriations. Um, I only can stress that we fully are in line with this uh, philosophy. Um, and uh, there are certainly more detail we need afterwards in the agreements like um, having uh, no disproportionate acts under the arbitrary acts. Um, but uh, what Frank Hofmeister said, that we need gold standards, is a common aim. Our experience shows that these principles, which I have recalled, um, can be fully implemented while still preserving the authority to regulate in the public interest. For us as Germans, this is self-evident because we have the use of property subject to social obligations in our constitution. What do we need? Um, for, what we need for implementing this strong protection for investors and investments is hard work, and Frank Hofmeister has shown a bit the way we have already uh, gone. Um, we therefore strongly support the negotiations by the European Commission and do this constructively. Even if I may mention that sometimes we have doubts, for instance, if it's the best starting point to negotiate with OECD countries. But once this is decided, I think we, we really have to go forward jointly and to come to very good outcome. The Council up to now has provided seven mandates for negotiations um, uh, to the Commission for negotiating over investments. Um, now, if we all agree on th that the transfer of competence to the European Union is a good thing and that we all aim at strong protection for our investors and investments, what are the challenges? In a first row of challenges, I would enclose those who refer to the internal structure of the European Union, and th this has already been mentioned by Ms. koch and by Frank Hofmeister. Um, for the European Union, investment protection and investor state disputes referring to investments are a new field of regulation. So far, we do not have yet all the necessary EU rules. Um, um, and one very important issue 
who is to be sued and who will have to bear the financial responsibility. This is an extremely complex matter and we have to fix it urgently because once we get the first investment protection treaty um, in place and have to apply it, we will need to have these rules in place when the investment treaty comes in force. It seems clear to me that where the European Union institution has acted, a complaint by an investor referring to this act has to be handled by the European institutions. On the other side, I am personally responsible for the Vattenfall case in Germany, where a German energy company has sued um, the German government um, for the closure of nuclear power plants. This is a huge case, extremely complex, with a high historic, technical, economic and commercial complexity we have on our hands. Um, we have thousands of documents, we have rules to apply, all in German. Um, and I, for me, as the responsible person, it's unthinkable to imagine that anybody but the national government uh, is in a position to defend this properly, to, to have decided this together with the German parliament. Where a member state has to pay, in case it does not win such a case, it must have the full right to defend it, in our opinion. Likewise, I do not think that it would be appropriate to put any financial responsibility on the European Union in cases where a member state acted on its own behalf. Um, on the other hand, we have to find rules for cases where the member state has just executed European law and is made responsible for that. It may be that he is the one to defend it, but certainly not to be the financial cost if he just executed something he did not, de he did not decide himself. In a second set, second set of challenges, I would enclose those with direct reference to the protection of European investments. Let me repeat here, the core problem for investments abroad is the change of leverage after an investment has been realized. We fully believe in the strength and commitment of the European Commission when realizing our common aim of strong protection of European investors and investments in the negotiations. However, some concerns and some very serious points remain um, from what we hear about the ongoing discuss, uh, discuss, uh, discuss negotiations with Canada, for example. Uh, the first point is indirect expropriation. Um, I think there is a high commonality of views on direct expropriation. Indirect expropriation means that somebody is done with is not a formal expropriation but has equivalent effects. Um, we have seen cases in the past where, for instance, local authorities have applied abusive taxes which would have uh, meant the bankruptcy of the investment. And um, it was only the Investment Protection Treaty which made, which made it possible to change this situation. Um, we need full protection against these types of indirect expropriation. Second point, from our point of view, we need two separate chap chapters on market access on invest and on investment protection. Uh, one issue is if I allow an investment um, and the second issue is if an investment has been realized legally, if we protect it. Um, the risk is if we mix these two issues, market access and investment protection, that on one side an investor might I I use investor state uh, dispute resolution in order to enforce market access. And on the other side, we get loopholes for investment protection, where, for instance, an investor has invested in a field where no formal market access has been agreed, say in transport, sea transport, or banks, or mining, and he has legally invested there. And it must certainly not be that afterwards he is expropriated without due course, of a due process and without the normal regulations for investment protection. Um, a third point, especially for Canada, is to have an agreement that is binding not only the state, but the provinces and municipalities too. This certainly will have to clearly state. 
And uh, for a fourth point uh, is uh, that we need effective guarantees for fair and equitable treatment and the fulfillment of commitments by public bodies to the investor. I have not mentioned yet a specific issue that is the right to regulate, which is uh, something very prominent in the discussions on investment protection. For us, it is quite evident that investment protection must not prevent regulations in the legitimate public interest. And the ne negotiation mandates for the Commission are quite clear with this respect. The issue is not the right to regulate, and I mentioned before, especially not for Germany where we have it in the Constitution, but protection against an appropriate compensation for discrimination of foreigners or unnecessary or disproportionate measures. The right to regulate is unquestioned, but it needs control. We must exclude that the right to regulate is used as a pretext to discriminate foreign investors. Um, Ms. koch you have mentioned the sustainable development issue. I think uh, it's a rather long issue we, I would prefer to have in the discussion, like Frank, because um, I think there's a lot to say. Um, uh, it's complex, and uh, the bilateral investment treaties um, are there to set a rule of law for the country where the investment is being realized. But uh, that is not all. We certainly need rules for the investor, but we need them elsewhere. Let me sum up. We believe in the strength of the European Union, but our concerns are serious on the technical, seemingly technical issues, which are certainly not technical issues, because they can be very vital for an investor. We should not accept loopholes or weak investment protection provisions um, and the European Union is the major investor in the world, which has a very strong interest in all that. The agreement made with Canada will set the standards and be the basis for European agreements with other countries, where we have unfortunately negative experiences that European investors really have been an easy prey for local authorities, and where we we'll still need strong investment protection. We therefore fully support the Commission with respect to reaching a strong and powerful agreement with Canada and with the other countries where we come to an end with our negotiations. This is of strategic importance for the future protection of European investments worldwide. And I was very happy to hear the word gold standards from Frank Hofmeister because um, for us too, quality comes first. If needed for appropriate results, we should not hesitate to take more time and, for instance, decouple chapters on investment protection from the rest of an FTA, if rather than accepting unsatisfactory outcomes there. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Henkel. Again, very interesting points raised there. Our next and final speaker for this panel discussion is Dr. James Zan. He is the Director of the Investment and Enterprise Division at the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, UNCTAD. And the division conducts extensive policy research, builds international consensus among 193 countries, and provides technical assistance to over 150 governments. Dr. Zan is also team leader of the annual UNCTAD World Investment Report and is the chief editor of the journal Transnational Corporations. Dr. Zan. Thank you very much, Karine. Um, uh, first of all, I wish to express um, my great appreciation for this invitation from um, from Koch uh, Nahreen uh, to give us this opportunity to exchange views uh, with this important um, audience. Um, what I would like to bring in on board is to complement what has been said by Mr. Hopmeiser and, and also Mr. Hanko. They have already uh, elaborated or highlighted a number of important issues from the European Union's perspective. So what I can do is try to bring in an outsider's perspective uh, in three respects. One is the, the EU's investment stake in kind of global setting. Second, the current trends in, in investment policy making worldwide. And the third, I would like to highlight the challenges for EU in, 
investment policy making, both at the national and international levels, in this new setting, so to speak. Um, I have three messages I wish to put up front right away. First is that the EU has a significant stake in global investment and the global investment relationship. Collectively, it accounts for 25% of global investment outward stock and 18% of global investment inward stock and accounts for two-fifths of the total international investment treaties. So this is the stake and I will, I will highlight it by more facts and figures later on with the PowerPoint slide. The second message is that international investment policy making is at a crossroads. What we have observed is the dichotomy between liberalization and regulation worldwide, both at the national and international levels. And we have also observed an emergence, an emerging kind of new generation of investment policies that characterized by a kind of a shift from the freedom of investment model to the model towards the kind of investment for development. The third message I wish to, to highlight is that all this poses a kind of series of challenges for the future international investment policy setting and the negotiations of the EU in three respects. One is that how to reflect this new investment landscape, including EU's position in, in the global um, investment, both inward and outward, particularly the fast and rapid growing um, of investment stock inside EU. The second is that given the current trends of moving from um, towards kind of sustainable and inclusive development model or the paradigm, that how to factor in sustainable development in the new investment treaties. Whether EU is the driver or that your negotiation partners are drivers, so we'll see but that's the reality. The third factor is relating how to put in place effective means to contain investment protectionism. I will elaborate on that. Now, first, you have the graphs. I don't know whether you can see it clearly. Um, the graph shows, uh, shows that EU has piled up its FDI stock abroad. It's a huge amount. According to our statistics, it's not highlighted in the World Mass Report that we produce, but in our database, we just try to pull out. If we count the outward investment stock, meaning of the EU, excluding intra-EU FDI stock, it has grown rapidly since 1990s, and it increased by more than five-fold by 2010, from 1990s to 2010, and it reached an estimated 3.8 trillion US dollars, accounting for 25% of the global outward FDI stock. If you look at, I don't know, can go to the next slide? Um, um, how to? Can we? Yes, that's, that's it. it. Yeah. Okay. And here it shows the kind of um, outward F stock, F FDI stock of EU as, as a whole and the rest of the world, and in fact, around 60% is located in developed countries, while close to 40% is located in a large number of developing countries. And I understand that, that you need effective investment protection, particularly in those developing countries where investment stock is piling up fairly rapidly from the EU. And if you look at, uh, in terms of sub-regions, Asia accounted for 16% of EU um, investment, and Latin America accounted for 8%. Central Eastern European countries accounts for another significant amount. Now, in terms of the importance of EU's outward investment to EU's economy, that's, there are a couple of figures I wish to highlight. In 2010, the investment income of the EU's outward investment reached 333 billion US dollars. That's the investment income generated by EU's outward investment. It counts for 37% of the total investment, investment incomes worldwide. 
And the rate of return for EU foreign affiliates uh, abroad uh, tend to some uh, close to 7% of investment returns in 2010, which is higher than the global average. Now, in terms of sales of foreign, um, foreign affiliates of EU, that um, again, excluding uh, the intra-EU activities, then it is also very significant. Um, they reached 4.9 trillion US dollars in 2009. And that's the latest figure that we can get. It accounted for 24% uh, of the total sales of foreign affiliates. And in terms of em employment and the EU's outward investment generated 12.3 million um, jobs uh, outside the EU. Um, it's almost one fourth of the employment generated by foreign affiliates of the TNCs worldwide. Now, in terms of inward investment, is that, no, the next slide, please. Okay. No, it's two, yeah, that's the one. It's also significant. We have seen that over the past decades, night from the 1990s to 2010, um, and the investment stock inward to EU increased also by fourfold and reached 2.3 trillion US dollars, account for 18% of the total global investment stock, inward stock. Um, that's also very significant. Now let me turn to um, the second point that I wish to make that relates to the global um, investment policy making trends. The slide shows um, a kind of uh, the trend, what we call dichotomy. In fact, countries, large number of countries um, are in a mode of reflecting, reviewing, and revising their investment laws and regulations and adjusting their negotiation positions. A large number of countries for several reasons. The two most important reasons is is the kind of uh, paradigm shift towards sustainable development. So you, you will see that, um, in fact, what we say that it's a kind of era of liberalization towards an era of regulation. And we have seen many countries putting in place um, many policies uh, related to sustainable development, inclusive growth, into their investment policies and into their um, international investment treaty models, which was not the case. And we, we saw the serious lack of that, and now it's coming up. The second driver of policy changes is related to industrial policies. Industrial policies is back, and back in fashion, we have seen a kind of broad-based kind of trends that countries are now formulating their industrial policies in one way or another. Um, and then they try to line up their investment policies with their industrial policies. There are, there are pros and cons of all these two, uh, which I wish to, to tell later on. But this graph shows that in terms of investment policy changes, if you look at um, the 1990s and even the beginning of, of the century, that um, the overwhelming majority of the policy changes were towards the direction of uh, in favor of investment and investors. It's on average 94% of the changes were in that direction. Now as time comes, and we have seen the changes towards more and more uh, investment regulations and investment restrictions, and that has been manifested by 2010, although in two th that reached over 30% of the policy changes. Although in 2011, last year, there was kind of a, a slight decline of the number of changes towards the restriction of investment. Um, as it was 22%, but we don't see that as a kind of reverse trend. We see it could be for some various reasons. Having said that, we also need to bear in mind that the, the risk of investment protectionism is coming back. Um, Overregulation is another risk. Um, if you look at the, 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 the the chain policy changes is not this graph that shows on a yearly basis, but also to see the cumulative effects of putting in, pay, in place the restrictive measures for investment 
number one. Number two, this graph shows only the new changes. What about um, the implementation aspect of the policies? What we called that the devil of investment pr pr uh, protection, protectionism is at the level of implementation. So that's another aspect mm -hmm. I wish to mention. We have the time yes. constraint um, that I know. Um, now let me just try to, to come to highlight um, the international policy change, changes. Just a the, few moments. Yes, uh, the investment policy making pace is still very rapid, although it's a slow down, but we see the shift. We see the shift from bilateral investment treaties towards regional investment agreements. And more and more countries are going towards the option of regional treaty making. And, and we have seen almost all the economic powers are using the regional approach. And we have seen the factoring in of sustainable development into the newly treaties. That has been in our, our report. Um, and then the key issue is the, the challenges, the systemic challenges. Um, we have this 3,000, over 3,000 bilateral investment treaties, and out of that, we, we, have, we have seen that uh, this kind of uh, overlapping um, and, and, and the gaps, inconsistencies, incoherence between the, between the investment treaties and also the, 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 the incoherence between the investment policy on the one side and other policies like trade, competition, intellectual property rights environment and so on and so forth. So there's a systemic problem. And investor state dispute settlement mechanism is also in difficulties and some countries are really um, trying to, to, to get out of that. So this is the, the systemic challenges we need to deal with. Okay, maybe um, that's, could, that's for that. Uh, now, just, some of those? just um, half a minute to okay. highlight the challenge for, for, for EU. Now, I think I mentioned earlier there are several challenges, and the first is how to address the investment issues from both host and home country perspectives. We see that's also a wave of investment getting into EU from outside. That's the changing landscape. Secondly, how to balance investment liberalization with regulation, and how to avoid investment protectionism. As we know that for the time being, there's no even a definition called investment protectionism. And how do we deal with that? Um, and and what, what will be the effective body international, at the international level to monitor and effectively to, to pinpoint those measures which are called the investment protectionism or rather than seeing legitimate right of regulation. And although that UNCTAD together with OECD are reporting to, to the G20, but that's only on G20 members, not the rest of the world. The third challenge is related to how to factor in sustainable development and inclusive growth into the investment treaties. And another one is how to address systemic complexity of today. Almost all countries are party to the investment treaties, but then almost it's hardly any country is happy with that system. Um, so that's that's an important challenge. And then another challenge is how to ensure the coherence between investment policies and other policies, and how to promote multilateral investment cooperation in the absence of a multilateral investment framework. So these are the challenges that we see in addition to the internal challenges, how to build consensus among 27 members of EU. Okay. So that's, that's the point. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, San, uh, and uh, sorry for having to interrupt you, but I am conscious that we do need to get another panel discussion in as, oh, oh sorry, if I beg your pardon. Um, I was just apologizing to Dr. Zan for interrupting, but we do have about 10, 15 minutes to take your questions now before we begin our second panel discussion. So anybody who wants to um, put a panel question to one of our panelists, raise your hand and if you could give us your name as well, please, and to whom you'd like to address the question. That's if you have questions to address. Anybody want to start off? Do we have a question here? Over here? Oh yes, gentleman there. Yeah. Just press the button, the speak button next to your mic. Which would be the one on your the go. right, yeah. Great. Uh, hello, <coughs> Andreas Galanakis. I'm with the American Chamber of Commerce to the European Union. Uh, just a general question for the panel. There was an EU-US investment principles adopted earlier this year. How do you think that will sort of uh, apply uh, to other countries? Is that something that uh, the Commission will sort of work on? Uh, that's, I think, it was part of the, the agreement. Uh, just sort of a general sort of uh, question in that regards. Again, the EU-US 
investment principles that were adopted that sort of set the stage for other sort of uh, uh, treaties. And then maybe just a second quick question on China and investment uh, uh, treaty uh, that perhaps will move ahead. If you could sort of elaborate a little bit uh, further on how that's progressing. Uh, it seems to be somewhat sort of uh, hit a roadblock of sorts uh, and what are those chances of, of, of progress ahead. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Frank, do you want to address those questions? <coughs> On the EU-US investment principles, I think uh, uh, they reflect the common approach of the current uh, administration and the Commission. Uh, what makes a modern investment protection treaty? Uh, also, our member states uh, have signaled uh, their full support. We try to convince others uh, that that could be used as a blueprint, but I have to tell you that uh, receipt of that is not very warm. So for the time being, I cannot uh, say, well, and this is now the standard everybody wishes to refer to. It's not, it's not happening. Uh, I guess uh, also from the perspective of third states, uh, it is more interesting to see what will be the first real chapters that uh, uh, come out uh, from either EU, China, Canada, OECD, or EU, uh, India, or Singapore, and elsewhere, and then to see how it, how it really will play. Um, on your second question on China, how is it progressing? Slowly. Uh, the leaders have uh, uh, already in spring said, we want this, but at the latest EU-China summit uh, a few weeks ago, uh, we couldn't uh, make another step forward, so uh, leaders agree to further, uh, how to say, encourage, um, the real big question is, of course, uh, how much are the Chinese government willing to look at uh, market access issues and not only protection issues? Uh, we know that Chinese uh, have a very hard uh, position also vis-à-vis -vis the United States on this uh, that is currently uh, making progress uh, difficult. Okay, thank you very much. Lady here had a question. Yeah, it's kind of uh, related to the question from Andreas. My name is Constanze Picking. I'm, uh, I'm working with the U.S. Chamber. Um, I, I was here last week when we heard, uh, when we had the hearing about the uh, uh, potential investment treaty um, with, uh, with China, and I was quite puzzled by the presentation of one of the panelists, uh, a professor, who said, actually, I mean, basically his point was, I mean, why bother? Um, apparently, there's no real need for an investment, uh, investment treaties. They are very little used. They are very little known in the, in the business community. Um, interviews, I mean, found out that, I mean, 60 or 70 percent of executives who are actually operating in these countries, I mean, particularly now in China, even don't know that an investment treaty exists. Um, they take up enormous resources for the negotiators. They are really hard to negotiate. So he, he made the point, I mean, that we, probably, that we really should think very, very careful if we want to, to go down this road, I mean, to devote so many resources on negotiating EU-wide investment treaties. Do you want to, maybe Dr. Henkel, on that one? Um, well, uh, if I may first second refer to our national experience in Germany. Um, we have uh, more than 130 bilateral investment treaties in place. And uh, there are very good reasons to have them. Um, many cases never appear to the public because um, you have a problem with local authorities. The tax case I mentioned, I could uh, mention in another country the case of public prosecutors who started criminal proceedings because somebody wanted to take over the investments or the property where the uh, establishment is being built on is being taken by somebody and the judiciary is not independent and is influenced and these cases very often you can solve them because you have an investment protection treaty in place because you can start negotiations with the partner countries through your embassy through political channels and solve it um, there are not, if this is not successful then you need the formal procedure which is coming to the public where really you get in, uh, the, the full picture. So, so we really believe that they are extremely important. 
Um, and uh, we have to, to choose the countries as Europe very carefully where we want to negotiate, where it is very meaningful. We have limited resources in the Commission. Um, uh, and and they, this, these resources have to be, to, to be spent in a, in a, and, and used in an appropriate way. But uh, uh, that we need them, no doubt. Okay, and Dr. Zan, you wanted to comment as well on that. Yeah, an observation uh, cross board regarding um, negotiations with China on investment treaties. Um, I think the major, major difficulties that both EU, US, Japan, Korea, Singapore, the, the high standards countries are facing with is pre-establishment national treatment. Um, for that issue, it's, China is very hard on that, but the implication is significant if China gives that in. It means a serious systemic reform of the country's investment monitoring and management system. That's the significance. That requires a reform, even. So that's why it's also very difficult for China just saying that we do it, but they need to see the implications. And once that barrier is overcome, I think all countries will, will, the life will be much easier for all other countries, EU, US, and others. That's one second thing regarding the disputes, the, the investor state dispute mechanism. It's, it looks like, as you said, there's not many cases. I think in all these bilateral investment treaties, post-establishment establishment treaties, protection treaties, there is a provision called exhaustion of domestic remedies, which is different from other treaties that you have with other countries where the investors can immediately go to international arbitration tribunal. But this one, you have to use that one the, uh, to have the exhaustion of domestic ones. That may prevent some, but there are disputes that have been resolved at the domestic court. But there are other reasons that they solve the problem using alternative dispute settlement mechanisms. Okay, thank you. Question? Yes, hello, my name is Chris Benedict. I'm a speaker on the second panel. And I'd like to chip in because the question that was asked addresses business. And I'm a legal advisor to a business. And I've come across this argumentation before in other panels or discussion groups that apparently there have been surveys that 60% or so of the business executives are not aware of the existence of a bilateral investment treaty. From my own experience, that may be true. Actually, if I look at certain executives, they may not even know what the tax code is in a given country. That is not their, that's not their task. They think about strategic big issues and if they want to know whether there's a bilateral interest investment treaty, they ask me, their in-house lawyer. And believe you me, they will do that when the inter-investment gets into trouble. And uh, if you look at the case reports of the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes, you will find that there is quite a number of businesses who actually go down that route of investment protection. So I somehow this is traded so as a certainty that nobody knows about these things, so why it important, why this is, does not at all reflect reality from my point of view where I stand. And um, actually I'd like to take the opportunity of addressing a question to Mr. Zahn, if I may. That is, um, you have pointed out that there is a paradigm shift and that there are um, questions how to factor in sustainable development and uh, I wanted to take the opportunity to ask the UN organization with the direct competence for trade and development whether you have any ideas or best practices or recommendations how sustainable development could in fact be factored in in the framework of investment protection. I'd be interested to hear that. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. And you said 60% is your experience no, of that's, that's executives. The, that's the, that's the figure that was given. Yeah, it's uh, my, my, no, 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 no. No, but these figures, I've, I've, I've come across I mean, them before. that's astonishing. If, I've, I've know, come across them before. Apparently, they date back to an earlier uh, study undertaken 10 years ago where there were people interviewed, but these were highest levels of management. And um, 
this is far too uh, nitty-gritty to nuts and bolts yeah. at that level. So. Okay, so I think if we'll take your question, uh, Christoph, as the final one. Uh, back to you, Dr. Zan, about the sustainability. Um, thank you very much. I think the, the trend is moving towards that direction. We try to, dominate, uh, to document the practices, what's going on. So if you have the World Investment Report, so page 90, we have a tabulation of the recently signed, the treaties signed in 2011, and the treaties like uh, Mexico, Peru, FTA, Republic of Korea, Peru, Panama, um, with all these, uh, China, Japan, Korea, Central America, Mexico, FTA, all these treaties and giving examples of what they have done so far towards that direction. And we have op also observed in those negotiations um, that there are provisions putting in. And, and the new treaty models, even the US one, the most recent one, also factoring provisions regarding public policies, environmental protection, these provisions into it. So that's what I'm saying. This is quite precise there. I, I don't deny that. I was more interested about the mechanism of how this is factored in, yeah. because that's where the rubber hits the road. We, we say that sustainable development dimension can be factored in through several, there are several means. One is preamble, we cut overall overarching objectives, and then we can do it through the structure, through the substantive provisions. In the substantive provisions, how do you address the issue, particularly using some flexibilities, like preserving the policy space, uh, reservations, exceptions, there are ways of doing that. And then also in the implementation provisions on that. Uh, and now we also advocate provisions like um, promotion and facilitation. If you look at all these bilateral investment treaties for promotion and protection of investment, in fact, the treaty is dominant by the provisions on protection, while the promotion provisions are not there. So the traditional thinking was that if you protect, by protect, you promote. But there are still ways and means to promote investment that could be measures for that. Uh, and investor state dispute settlement, yes, I think uh, Mr. Hankel already said, on the one hand, we need to, to make sure the rules of law, but on the other hand, we need to also ensure that some of the claims are really not um, um, uh, that the frivolous, frivolous, so to speak. Okay. Um, so that's a challenge. Okay, Thanks. and uh, Frank just wanted to make a final point on that before we leave this discussion. Yes, thanks, Karen. Uh, the UNCTAD investment report makes very precise recommendations later on after the analysis on, uh, and uh, you find on page 114 and 41 a, a table with all the different elements. Uh, and the basic ideas here, and I cite from it, is um, options to craft more sustainable development friendly agreements include one, adjusting existing provisions, two, adding new ones, or three, introducing the concept of special and differential treatment. And then the table says more or less what are sub options. From an EU point of view, and I can tell you we have studied the report with great uh, detail, uh, option number one is not the right way because adjusting existing provisions, if you look at the sub-options, could even go as far as omissions, just don't put free and equitable treatment in the treaty, or reservations, carve-outs. So for us, this is lowering of protection, not an option. Okay. Number, okay. Sorry. Yeah, the number two, uh, because it's important, important huh? it's really, yeah, it's, it's an important, really important point. Important. Huh? Yeah. Number two, adding new provisions. Uh, there you can talk about yeah, uh, investor uh, obligations, uh, corporate social responsibility, all right. Number three, special differential treatment, very careful. So that's just uh, to be very precise for the, the experts here in the room, I allow myself to make a comment on that. Thank you. Okay. Can um, I just say a few words? It has to be really, really it's brief. It's very important. Okay. Yeah. Um, I fully understand uh, Mr. Um, Mr. Hofmeiser's um, um, view on that. Um, and in, in fact, I had that part of my presentation which was cut. Um, the important thing is that in our um, uh, policy framework, we, we take the option approach. We are not saying that this is the thing you should do, that thing that you should do. We say that these are the possible options if 
if individual governments would like to go for that direction. And we, we arranged the options from the, the most open liberal to the least, or they call it more of regulations. But these are the options, and it's a kind of a policy tool for countries to use. It depends on the situation, context, and also depends on the, 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 the specific situation of individual countries. Um, so it's not for you, it's for everybody to take and pick and choose. Okay. It's like a menu in the restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well on that point we'll leave this particular panel discussion, but if you could show your appreciation please for Professor Frank Hofmeister, Dr. Hans Joachim Henkel and Dr. James Zahn. And if I can now welcome to the podium our three new speakers who are Dr. Pascal Carnis, Dr. Arturo Gonzalo and Dr. Christoph Benedict. We'll do a very quick change around here and begin the second part of the discussion. But gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and again, if you um, do find that there are questions that you would like to put to our next three panelists, please take a note of them. We're running about 15 minutes behind schedule, but I'm told that we have a little bit of flexibility in that regard. So we're going to try and give the full hour again to our uh, panel discussion, which is going to take place. And the theme now, sticking with obviously the EU investment protection policy, is what implications for third countries dispute settlement and businesses. This was obviously the, uh, a topic that came up during the first part of the discussion, and we're going to um, hear more on that topic from our next three speakers. So, gentlemen, do we have you all in place? Okay. Okay, so a very quick turnaround, and our first speaker is Dr. Pascal Carnice. He's the Managing Director of the European Services Forum and he was appointed MD of the ESF at the launch meeting of the organization in January 1999. And I'm sure you know that ESF is a network of representatives from the European services sector committed to promoting actively the interests of European services and the liberalization of services markets throughout the world in connection with the GATS 2000 negotiations. And again, our three panelists are going to discuss the topic of what implications for third countries dispute settlement and businesses. Dr. Carnies. I have no idea how does it work on this. Oh, just press the button. And yeah. for, the, for the slides? The slides should be coming up. Yeah, we have your slides here. Okay. Yeah, first slide is up. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation to this uh, interesting panel on investment. Uh, I will quickly introduce what ESF is, then see some figures, uh, because to listen to the figures is interesting. To see them maybe is also striking. Uh, to uh, highlight a bit the share of services in these investment, and then to give you some of the, of the priorities. So a quick introduction of ESF. If the next slide, um, uh, next one, yeah, uh, it's, it's about it's about all the different services sectors which are present in, in the European Services Forum. And, and the idea is to represent their interest when they export abroad or, in particular, invest abroad. Next one, uh, a list of some of the companies. Uh, so that is what ESF. Next one, sh share of the EU um, into the world uh, foreign direct investment outflows, you can see here clearly that the European Union is indeed the biggest investor in the world. And we have already a very strong investment intra-EU. I think that is also important to highlight because that's also thanks to the single market that our companies can uh, uh, invest within the European Union uh, at, at a higher space. Uh, so uh, the second one is with the United States, Japan, Russia, China, and when we hear again and again in every newspaper that China and China and China again is investing, 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 the figures are here, it is not that impressive compared to what the European Union and the United States are doing. Next one. If we look at um, the inward stocks or inward, as we have already heard earlier, you can see that the European Union uh, uh, has very important presence abroad and 4.2 billion euros are invested by EU companies uh, in other countries outside the European Union. Uh, and we are also a big receiver, among the biggest receiver of investment, which is 
for us very important because we want to have investment coming to the European Union because that is indeed the way our companies can keep competitiveness because we have to keep pace and therefore uh, the more the European Union is open to foreign direct investment the better for us to oblige us to continue to be competitive. Next one. Let's have a look on what the services, the share of services is into these FDIs <clears throat> because I think it is in interesting. In the uh, 2005 to up to 2007, services was about 70% of all investment going sent by European companies abroad outside the EU was going or done by services companies. Uh, we had a, a drop then uh, after the crisis and now it is picking up again. Um, and when you see what is the other part mining, agriculture, but then also when you look at the details, they talk about gas, electricity, water, uh, construction, which for me is clearly a service. Uh, you can see that in the other, in green there, you have also part of services companies which are investing in there. Uh, but it is not so clear. Next one, uh, we, you're probably not going to see the figures, but it is then going into the details of the different sectors. Uh, and there, I have some, some questions myself, um, and maybe uh, UNCTAD report is giving a bit of, of the, of the uh, hint in there, but yes, the services uh, uh, companies are investing the bigger, taking the bigger role in investment abroad, but this notion of global value chain I think is very important nowadays, and it's very difficult to, come to make the distinction between what is a good and what is a service. And uh, if you take the, the bigger line into the investment, which is financials uh, and, and uh, insurance activities, uh, the reality here is that a large investment done by a manufacturing company, a car company, or a power plant, or whatsoever, it's a big investment, and therefore there is a need for a, a bank or an asset management company to make a syndicate to pool this money. And that goes through the bank and therefore it is included into the in financial intermediation. But at the end of the day, the money is not staying in the bank. The bank is invested then into a project. And therefore, the line between investment into services or by services companies and manufacturing companies are not that easy. And I think that is something which we really have to assess and analyze a bit bigger to understand these different flows of services uh, uh, investment. <clears throat> Next one. Also interesting, and we have seen already that with Dr. Chan uh, earlier, uh, looking at the, where the money is going, where the investment is going. Uh, and there, interesting to highlight North America. The link between the EU and Canada and the United States is extremely important. That's easy to say. Here you have the figures. And this is going both ways. So of course we are interested to have an investment protection uh, with Canada. Uh, of course, we would like to have, as soon as the negotiations are going to be launched with the United States, uh, investment protection uh, following the principles which have been adopted um, uh, in, in, in this agreement. But then it is true that within the OECD countries, the, there is already a tradition of respect of the law and respect of the rules, and therefore maybe we could say there is no need to have these three ITs. But I think now that we have the chance that we're already negotiating with Canada and hopefully concluded soon, that we're going to launch soon a US negotiation with the United States, we have a chance to set up at the very beginning of the new EU investment policy, uh, a high standard investment protection policy by the EU, therefore then it would be possible to go further. Of course we are in the services sectors very much interested in launching negotiations with China, but indeed there are already 26 countries out of 27 uh, which are already protected by an investment uh, treaty bilaterally among, in the, among the member states. So therefore, for us to have an investment protection agreement only without tackling the market access issues uh, is something that we see less interest. And therefore, we certainly encourage the Commission and member states to continue to, to, to push to have market access negotiation with China. Next one. Let's go quickly um, through... Uh, the different um, priorities from the services sectors uh, into the investment pr protection. It is something that you will, you will uh, see clearly. And of course, we welcome the new protection. I mean, as has been said earlier, for the services industry, 
for us, it's a kind of a natural uh, uh, extension of the process. We are used to the GATS uh, of the WTO, the General Agreement on Trade in, in Services, and the more three of the GATS is an investment treaty. So um, uh, what is missing there is the investor-to-state dispute, and we hope to have that through the investment policy, because in the GATS, of course, when there is a problem, it has to go uh, through the member states. We welcome uh, the final compromise uh, on the regulation between on, on the existing BITs, uh, uh, and I think uh, that the, the compromise is something acceptable for us. We, we haven't gone into lobbying quite clear uh, on the details of this regulation because we thought that was more for the political side to decide. Uh, uh, it was obvious that the highest protection uh, is, is obviously our option for the companies. We welcome the new mandates. Um, to include investment protection into the new generation. So the seven one you have listed there, Canada, Singapore, and India has been mentioned, and the other one are Egypt, uh, Jordan, Morocco, and Tunisia. But we certainly urge the, 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 the Council to also include in the new forthcoming negotiation with Japan, with US, and the others, and with the ASEAN, because with ASEAN we have also uh, very interesting issues, uh, to include investment protection in the new agreements. Next one. We need strong EU investment protection. So what the European companies uh, are looking for is, of course, for the greatest protection, which means equivalent or better, why not, than the, what exists already in, in the existing one. Because we have, in, among these 1,200 or more uh, existing BITs signed by the different B member states, some of them are quite old and some of them have a protection which is a bit outdated to, to, the, to the new standard now, and therefore we might uh, go into a better one in, in, the, in the next one. The different cornerstones, maybe they're not all been mentioned today, they are, they, are, they, are, they are of course well known by the expert, but uh, the core principles are um, non-discriminatory national and most favorite nation into these uh, treaties, high and clearly defined fair and equitable treatment. Uh, I know that there are a lot of cases uh, in the different arbitration courts on this. Um, if it would be a little bit more defined, I think it would give more uh, clear visibility uh, uh, to, the, to the companies and understanding and maybe avoid some disputes, which is also, uh, I think, the idea. Then prompt and adequate effective compensation, of course, in the event of an expropriation, and I certainly support the idea of, of course, covering the uh, indirect expropriation. And finally, uh, not, not mentioned but capital for us, is indeed the free transfer of invested capital and return to the headquarters when decided by, by the company. Uh, next one. My last one, uh, Chairman, investor dispute. Uh, yes, we uh, are uh, calling to have a state-of-the-art investor to set dispute into uh, the investment protection agreement uh, uh, by the European Union. Uh, I understand that some of the NGOs in some countries are saying uh, this is not acceptable and our country can be condemned, but I think uh, if we take uh, maybe, uh, I don't know what the figure is, but if we take all these uh, 3,000 BITs which exist in the world, uh, the very, very large majority of them have invested to state dispute settlement. So for us, if there is a EU investment protection policy uh, which is thinking of not having an investor to state, I think we should stop it immediately. A specific time frame is important. Uh, if we take the NAFTA investment chapter, uh, um, they allow cases to go for a long time, uh, and by not taking a decision, the, the thing is actually the company is losing money and they don't see any decision coming and therefore they drop the case. And that is the reason why the United States have never been condemned into the NAFTA system. Uh, on investment chapter. So I think uh, we would like uh, to have a time frame, like for instance in WTO cases, so that it is clear that when we start an arbitration, it goes uh, on, on, short, on a specific time period. We are also supporting the Commission proposal about the responsibility. I think it's, it's quite fair that uh, it is, if something has been done by a member state on its own behalf and the European Union has not been involved, the European Union should not be uh, involved. But if the member state has indeed taken a decision uh, um, uh, to, to which is going to lead to expropriation of whatever investment, of course the European Union has to take its responsibility. And finally, um, the EU must also find a, a creative way, if I may say so, 
uh, uh, to be allowed into the arbitration courts when the EU is going to be attacked. Now, uh, EU is not yet member of ICSID or UNICITRAL. It's going to take a long time to be member of because all the members have to agree. And therefore, we hope that member states are going to be very cooperative in these cases to allow this going on. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Interesting points raised there as well. Now, um, also, I'm sure very interesting points from our next speaker because he represents uh, Repsol. Dr. Arturo Gonzalo is the Corporate Director for Institutional Relations and CSR with Repsol. He was also, uh, previous to that, Secretary General for the Prevention of Contamination and Climate Change with the Spanish Ministry of Environment. That was between 2004 and 2008. And before that, he worked at Repsol as Head of Department for Environmental Planning and was later promoted to Deputy Director on Climate Change and Environmental Planning, Security and Quality. Uh, Dr. Gonzalo. Thank you very much. First, I would like to express our appreciation for this invitation to take part in this uh, very timely and welcome seminar. We think we are at a crucial point in this field of investment protection, and uh, we think that our case may be of interest to help to shape the EU investment policy and to try to keep in mind the real difficulties and limitations that the current instruments are showing in our case. Very briefly, probably all of you know that Repsol is a company active in something like 30 countries. We operate in, in places like Libya, Venezuela, Bolivia, Ecuador, and a long list, so we, we may find very different, uh, let's say, business climates, very interesting ones. And we've been very active in Argentina and this is the case I'm, I'm especially interested in talking about today. Uh, in 1999, we bought the main oil and gas company in Argentina, YPF. We paid in that time $15 billion in cash for the company. We've been operating the company since then, and we think that we have been a very good corporate citizen in Argentina. We have been the main taxpayer. We have more than doubled the workforce in the country. Uh, and we have been supporting, supported and praised by the government during all this time. Uh, suddenly, a change of attitude took place at the beginning of this year and started what we consider a harassment campaign. We were repeatedly menaced for expropriation. We were uh, withdrawn exploration and operation licenses with no, uh, with no reason. And in, in that time, from 1st of January 19, sorry, of this year to mid-April, the value of YPF shares in Buenos Aires and in New York, because this is a company listed both in Buenos Aires and New York, plummeted more than 50%. And then in April 16th, the president of Argentina, Mrs. Fernández de Kirchner, announced that she was sending to Congress an expropriation law, but of a very special sort. Only YPF was expropriated and only 51% of the shares from one single shareholder, which was Repsol. By that time, we, have, we had given entrance to the company to some local investors, and in that time, Repsol had 57% of YPF. Only Repsol was expropriated <coughs> in this moment, and with no compensation at all. So we, we don't call this an expropriation, we call it a confiscation which is what it is. Uh, at the same moment that the President Fernández de Kirchner was, sending, was announcing this new law, civil servants from the Argentine government entered our headquarters in Buenos Aires. They gave 10 minutes to our executives to leave the building with their personal belongings, and the 15,000 workers of YPF, 
until that moment, employees of Repsol as well, their telephone lines and emails were cut. This, this is how, how it happened. We have, of course, had a lot of support from the EU, and I want to express our appreciation for it. We had a lot of support from the European Commission, from DigiTrade especially, but from the European Parliament as well, that passed a resolution invoking the necessity of, of you know, protect foreign investments. But so far we've had the opportunity to, to see what are the real instruments we have to avoid a situation like this or to respond to a situation like this. And I would say that we have a multilateral framework for trade protection, which is WTO. We may be more or less happy about how it works, but we have that. But we don't have a multilateral framework for investment protection. We only have bilateral investment protection treaties, BITs, we are discussing if we are happy with them or not. Of course, it's much better to have them than not having them, but they are not enough. BITs just open the door to international arbitration at the best. But international arbitration shows a lot of limitations and deficiencies. Uh, in our case, the reference tribunal is ICSID, is a very respected one, and of course we are very supportive of it, but it is well known that arbitration procedures may last for a very long time. And in this case, the principle of justice delayed, justice denied, is the one to take into account. If you have been confiscated an asset worth $10.8 billion without any compensation at all, receiving a favorable award 10 years later is not a really good outcome. And the problem is more serious than that because the recipient country may choose to ignore the award and not paying for it. And in the case of Argentina, Argentina has never paid for an award requiring the country to do so. And we think that nothing has happened. If a country may confiscate an asset worth $10.8 billion and nothing happens, then what is at stake is the rule of law, globally speaking. This is our point of view. We are at a crucial moment, at, at the crossroads, as Dr. San said, and we think that the EU, who is the main foreign direct, direct investment uh, source in the world, has to show the way to an improved international scheme mechanism of investment protection. And we have to address several issues in this respect. First, we think it's very interesting to articulate the uh, stakeholders' consultation. We think that European companies have to work in very close cooperation with the Parliament and with the European Commission and the Council as well. I, I stress that we are having this kind of, of communication with the Commission especially, and we appreciate that very much. Second, European investment protection scheme has to stress the importance of enforcement mechanisms. So far, it's not clear how international arbitration awards are going to be enforced. We have to work to improve the dispute settlement mechanisms. We think that we can help, we Europeans and European institutions and European business we can try to improve the procedures of international arbitration. We have to improve transparency. Uh, we have to improve lack of predictability, lack of coherence. This is absolutely necessary. 
we think that the EU can go further than investment protection treaties. We think that multilateral bodies have also a role to play. For instance, international financial institutions, they should have also a role to play. We don't think that it's very reasonable that if you are not complying with the awards of an arbitration court, you may be eligible to get loans from the very same institutions. Uh, we also think that the EU can work closer with our allies and friends in the world to improve how, for instance, OECD deals with these issues. Uh, we think this is not a, a specific case. You know? We think this is a European-wide case or even a global case. And if we allow that the international investment protection gets challenged by this kind of new, um, new debate stressing the importance of regulation, then what will be at stake will be the, the, the rule of law. So thank you very much. This was the, the main uh, message I wanted to leave here today, and I'm, of course, at your disposal for your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. An amazing story, and I'm sure some of you may have questions to put to Dr. Gonzalo about all of that. But our final speaker, who's going to, I think, really bounce on some of the points that have already been made, is Dr. Christoph Benedict, who's the General Counsel for Alstom Germany. And, of course, Alstom Deutschland AG is the German branch of a French multinational engineering company. It has some 92,000 employees in 73 countries, so very significant. And before joining Alstom, he had worked as legal counsel for the International Projects Branch of Zublin, which is a major civil contractor. He also teaches at Swansea University UK and at the Europa Institute of Saarbrücken University. Christoph. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know how you came to Brussels for this seminar. But if you came by train and used the TGV or the Thales or the Eurostar, I hereby thank you on behalf of my company for using one of our most popular products. Thank you so much. In the same vein, the probability that the electricity coming out of the light bulbs in this room uh, at this very moment being produced by a machine that was built or serviced by Alstom is about 40%. We are one of the world leaders in rail and infrastructure, uh, power and rail infrastructure and we are active around the globe. Unsurprisingly, the countries most in need of infrastructure are those which don't have a lot. We call them developing countries. So we are at the moment building, for example, the new metro in New Delhi, or a highly efficient, environmentally friendly power plant in Peru. So we go out to countries where there's little infrastructure and try to build new infrastructure that makes the life better for the people who live there. And, mind you, we are an investor um, because we contribute many money and assets for a certain duration. We take risk and we hopefully contribute to the host state's development. We had this confirmed <clears throat> by a number of investor state arbitration tribunals, which we had to go to over the years, unfortunately, because of problems that arose in that country. Let me make clear that most of our problems are solved by negotiation. And even when negotiation fails, there is usually an arbitration mechanism in the contract. And only in exceptional cases, we have to rely on investor state arbitration. Unfortunately, these cases are often the biggest, the most complex, the most risky, and the most loss-making cases. Um, I could add a story pretty similar to what my colleague of Repsol has just told, but I skip over it for the sake of time. Just take it from me that we have come to appreciate very much the protection afforded by bilateral investment treaties and the investor state arbitration system that goes with it. It's not as if we would win all the cases that we submit to these tribunals but we can be certain that there is a mechanism somewhere that is governed by the rule of law available at last resort. We need that protection from time to time. Its sheer existence and reliability helps to foster the rule of law in our investments. So, 
Now that you know where I come from, I shall lavish some praise, especially on the Council and the Commission, which have stated that the new European legal framework shall not negatively affect investor protection and the guarantees afforded under the BITs. We have also heard the world of the gold standard. I am very much in favor of that gold standard. I also think that praise is, um, is appropriate for the Commission proposal for a regulation for transitional arrangements for existing BIDs, BITs allowing them to exist for some time. And being at the European Parliament, I'm very happy to read in the resolution of 6th of April 2011, that has already been mentioned by Ms. koch -Marin, that also the European Parliament, quote, stresses that investor protection for all EU investors must remain the first priority, quote, the first priority of investment agreements. And it quite rightly points out that future EU policy shall, quote, draw on the best practices of BITs. Having now been, been laudable about things, I have to pinpoint a few minor details in the resolution which seem a bit surprising. First of all, this resolution is pretty vague and at times reads slightly contradictory about what it understands by investment. There are repeated calls to define it clearly. Calls go to the Commission and to the Council but there is no definition proposed. Instead, other concepts are introduced which are, to the reader at first glance, not entirely self-explanatory, like the EU investor, the speculative investment, I, I would question is not any investment speculative, but okay, the high quality investment. We have quality managers in our firm. Are they going out to manage or, or assess the quality? I have no idea. Then we have the sustainable investment. I addressed Mr. Zahn on that. I'll come to that in a moment. The environmentally friendly investment, and we have the labor fostering investment. Okay. I'm an investor, or I'm not, but I am the in-house counsel of an investor. I'm not sure whether I am or we are any of those other investors. I hope to learn in the, mean, in, in the course of events. The definitions are not really clear and the consequences of an investment not meeting such qualifications are even less clear. If we are not one of those, what's the consequence? Shall our investment not be protected at all? Shall I receive lesser protection? Which one? Are there good protections for good investments and bad protections for bad quality? Sustainable, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm asking these questions. Uh, since we are in a legislative process, I'm sure that the organs will neatly address them and leave us with um, regulations which are very clear and provide what we most need, namely investment security. Yeah? If you make an investment decision, that is the core problem, you invest substantial amounts of money, billions, for a long period of time, often for periods which last longer than the government you contract with, or even two governments. This is the core problem of investment protection. There is a body of law which has evolved around that problem for the last half century. It's called investment, international investment protection law. And I do not see at the moment why the EU should reinvent that body. But whatever the EU does, my plea today, which I want to leave here on the table of the esteemed legislators is, please make it clear so that we know what the investment protection looks like, so that we know what the framework is and that we have security. This is my ardent plea. As to the details, we can be flexible. But at the end, when my management, of which, about which we learned that they may not know that there is a BIT, but when we run into problems, 
they will come to me and they will ask me, so is the metro we are building in New Delhi, is that a speculative investment? We are speculating to make a profit, aren't we? Or is it sustainable? Perhaps it's more sustainable to have a metro in a megalopolis of 15 million than to have car traffic, but perhaps it's less sustainable than to have them all cycling. I don't know. Some, I, I, I will be the one who will have to answer these questions to my management. So this is the interesting part. And I'm a bit worried also. I want to leave a plea and I want to leave a worry and then I'm almost done. I'm a bit worried about other parts of the resolution which taken together seem rather conceived to, um, well, it says we want to draw on best practices of the BITs. When I read it, I have the personal, non-official opinion that it may more aptly be turned, it's watering down best practices. If you look at the interpretation given on this non-discrimination, fair and equitable treatment, prohibition of expropriation, the umbrella clause that is in, I think it was margin no 19 of the resolution, these concepts are redefined in such a way, I have to say that there is not really much left of them. Yes, likewise the idea of having to exhaust the local remedies first, it also would take out most of the value out of the exit system. As a rule, you can be pretty sure that if we go to exit arbitration in the first place, years and more years of negotiation and trying to settle in mediation or contract arbitration have already taken place. Usually the client will do anything to derail the process, make it long, and as my colleague justly pointed out, justice delayed is justice denied. So what we must avoid, please, is giving somebody who wants to derail the process of the rule of law more pretexts to do so. This is also another ardent plea and a worry. So if you have to go additionally through, to, through, three, through, sorry, if you go additionally through two or three instances of state courts before you go to investor state arbitration, then you have First, you have usually tried a contract arbitration. Then you have three instances of state courts. Then you go to exit, or whatever mechanism the EU agreement foresees. And then, I don't know what happens in these mechanisms, but in exit, you can also annul decisions. So you have six instances. Even if all these instances work very neat and very fast, the, your project is dead. Your investment is dead. That's the whole idea. The whole idea to involve the state court is a bit strange to me because I come from a project environment and in project environments that what is, what is done, the method of choice is you choose arbitration. That is not true only for our company, that is true all over the world. This is a very well established system so I cannot understand when I read the resolution why it seems from time to time to be informed by a vague notion that investment arbitration somehow is a lesser quality forum than state courts. Of course, you need to balance the national interest or the famous policy space against the interests of investor arbitration, but I would be really glad if somebody here could come up with a good reason why a specialized arbitrator who does just this balancing, who does just this balancing for decades like E. Fortier, Brigitte Stern, Jan Paulsen should be any less qualified to make this balance than an ordinary administrative tribunal. I'm uh, actually pretty much finished. And um, want to just come to the conclusion that I have lavished praise, I have left my worries and my plea. And I'm taking something home from today. That is the reassurance that I've heard from the utterance of Mr. Hofmeister today that the uh, EC Commission will not go into adjusting assisting provisions as the UNCTAD calls it, because that might do away with investor protection. Uh, I very much hope that this point will carry the day 
and I hope that the European Parliament will come to a conclusion on that with the Commission and the Council. Thank you so much. Thank you very much and really interesting points raised there by all our panellists. Um, I'm also just conscious that we may not have heard so much from representatives from third countries or indeed NGOs who may feel like that changing legislation which may affect trade might in fact be in their interest. So if there is anybody who might represent those views who may want to raise a question, I think just it might be interesting as well to see the other perspective. But I think many of you may have questions for our three panelists. Um, if you want to raise your hand and we will come to you. Yes, lady at the back. If you could give me your name and maybe who you'd like to address the question to. Just tap the button okay. on the right hand side. My name is like. uh, Miriam Gisling. I work for the S&D group um, as a trade advisor. I have a question I think for both our, our panelists on, um, you were mentioning the idea of um, how the standards are defined and you're saying that in our resolution where we wrote that fair and equitable equitable treatment and indirect expropriation and so on, these concepts should be clearly defined. But I seem to hear different views. I hear, hear from Mr. Pascal Kenis that it is better that the, the standards are well and clearly defined, whereas I hear from Ms. Benedict that if the standards, it's better to keep them how they are in the member states' uh, BITs right now, which is without a very clear definition which guarantees stronger protection. So it's a little bit of a contradictory story and I don't understand why making the standards clearer means watering them down. Um, yeah, okay, that's thank you for that. Krista? Uh, I understand that this is addressed to me so I shall take it uh, directly. Um, the standards like non-discrimination, fair and equitable treatment these are, if you so want, by their sheer formulation, they are lofty standards. These are not very clear words. But there is a body of law that goes with these standards. It's like free movement of goods in the EC, in the EC treaty, as it used to be called. Free movement of goods, what is it? Nobody knows. But there is a jurisprudence of the European Court of Justice that goes into great detail. And for these national treatment, non-discrimination, fair, equitable treatment, protection against expropriation. You have a body of law which is equivalently big and it goes into very, very great detail what is an expropriation and in which cases uh, you have to balance which way. Uh, and these cases are public. They're, they're published in the, in the exit review. Anybody can see them for, for, um, in the exit case reports. So if I say watering down, I say when I read what is written in this resolution in margin note 19, I see that non-discrimination or let's say fair and equitable treatment as defined on the basis of the level of treatment established by international customary law. That is no way the standard of treatment which is afforded in this jurisprudence. This is as if you say free movement of goods is only if whatever a hyphy set crosses the border between Spain and France. Yes, of course it's much clearer, but it takes away most of it. Okay. Dr. Carnes, did you want to come in on that? No, I, I think uh, Christoph is, is a much big, better expert than I am. But um, I think if the negotiators want to extract the higher level of the standard of what the body of law is saying on fair and equitable treatment and put that into... Uh, the description of what is a fair and, and, and equitable treatment into a, an, an agreement, why not? Um, is, it, it would just eventually avoid, uh, when you go to an arbitration, uh, which part of the body of law you're going to take. Of course, the other opponent is going to, to argue the other way around. Uh, so therefore, when it is written in the treaty itself, uh, I think it might be clearer and avoid some disputes. But of course, uh, it, it is uh, not, not without saying that we are all, uh, aiming for the highest protection possible. So if we go and put something into the text, it should be uh, uh, the, the highest of these standards. <coughs> okay. Um, do we have other questions? Maybe for Dr. Gonzalo, um, because I think Repsol is such a, an interesting case right now. Um, if there's no hand up, perhaps I could put a, a question to you, um, Dr. Gonzalo. W 
what was the reason that the Argentinian government gave you when they decided to, as you say, confiscate Repsol? Well, I have to say that um, in, in Argentina, YPF is a, a kind of, of sovereign issue. I mean, YPF used to be the state company. YPF started exploring and producing hydrocarbons in Argentina 100 years ago. I mean, something like uh, it's part of the Argentine identity, you know, and I think it's very easy to, to excite nationalistic sentiments with these kind of, of companies working on natural resources. But they, uh, they accused uh, YPF, Repsol in YPF, of not investing enough to reverse the decline in production that was beginning to take place. And I have to say that this is a kind of, of de decline that takes place in countries of, civil, of similar maturity, something similar to the U.S. or, or, or even North, North Sea fields. And uh, we found, we discovered a very relevant and conventional oil and gas reservoir, which is called Baca Muerta. And this was the big new resources that we intended to develop to uh, reverse that decline. But I think that the, the Argentine government thought that this was such an a important new resource that they wanted to take back the control of the company. Uh, I have to say that at that moment, YPF represented 34% of oil and gas production in the country. So we were the main player, but we, we were not at all the majority of the sector, you know. Uh, I have to say that, of course, that we recognize the right of any country to expropriate those assets they think that are necessary for national uh, objectives, but they have to pay a compensation for it. So if the Argentine company wanted to take back the control of the company, they just had to do it according to the Argentine and international laws. They had to launch a 100% takeover bid as the YPF bylaws and the privatization law clearly establishes, and they had to pay a fair compensation for it. But they didn't. And that's why, why we think this has been unlawful, and that's why we think that the reasons given by the Argentine government are excuses that don't break the principle that this has been contrary even to the Argentine law. Amazing story. Okay, well, um, we are running out of time. And um, thank you again to our three speakers who were fantastic, Dr. Pascal Karnais, Dr. Arturo Gonzalo, and Dr. Christoph Benedict. <coughs> I'll hand you back uh, to Silvana now. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thanks to all uh, of the uh, panelists of the first and the second panel. I think it would be good if you could just turn off your microphones and there's less, less of an echo. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, what I think what we heard here was on one hand very inspiring and also was um, uh, giving us m again more ambition for the upcoming negotiation. I thought it was, was really inspiring and impressive was the consensus that I heard in the first panel of, uh, concerning the new role of the EU. That's not always very clear <laughs> in the day-to-day -day discussions that we sometimes have between European Parliament, uh, Council and um, European Parliament and Commission on the one side, if I may say so, and the Council on the other, without going um, too much in, down a confrontational way. So this was very, very positive to hear and also, I think, um, uh, also quite timely to, to hear that. And this is good to take with us for the negotiation of the next dossiers, as I mentioned in my kind of remarks, introductory remarks, I uh, don't want to repeat them here. It reflects the new reality. And I think it was also interesting to hear the, the slightly differing point of views of um, EU Commission and this time EU, um, representative of one of the member states on the one side and UNCTAD on the other concerning some, uh, so to say, added uh, issues for investment um, protection activities. What I thought was very encouraging to hear from the second panel, the, um, what you expect of the EU, 
that you want more EU, that you think that this is good for business to have more and stronger and clearer EU and that this has on a global level a bigger impact than if it's single member states, even if it's big member states on their own out there, um, that you want a clear uh, defined role for, um, for the EU in various international um, activities and be it an exit or others and that you also have an ambitious vision uh, beyond the bilateral investment treaties which is also an interesting point uh, and I think is something worth looking into again and also the few elements of praise for European Commission's activities I'm sure Frank Hofmeister marked this day in pink in his calendar and is delighted to take that back home um, so I think um, it, for me at least, was a very, very interesting seminar highlighting different um, aspects of, uh, of one issue. And um, uh, I thank you very much again for coming here from Madrid, from Berlin, from um, others didn't have to, we are, <laughs> when to, look, it's not Paris, it's also Berlin. <laughs> others didn't have to go so far from, to, to Paris, from Ireland. Uh, thanks to all of you, and now uh, there is a well-deserved uh, reception outside where you can refresh yourself with some drinks and continue to discuss. Thanks for being here. Thank you.